may be down and feel like God has somehow forgotten oh that you're faced with circumstances you can get through and it may seem there's no way out and you're going under oh, but God has proven time and time again he'll take care of you and he'll do it again he'll do it again if you just take a look at where you are now and where you've been hasn't he always come through for you he's the same now as then you, know that God has not changed. you may not know how you he may not, not know changed. when but he'll do it again God knows the things we are going through he knows when we're hurting you see he knows when our hearts have been broken in two but he's the god of the sun and the moon and he's our father and he'll find just the right way to fix this for you and he'll do it again he'll do it again if you just take a look at where you are now and where where you been hasn't he always come through for you he's the same now as then you may not know how you may not know when but he'll do it again oh he's still god he never changes he's still god he never fails i know he you you just like Moses just like Daniel just like Shadrach Meshach and Abednego he'll do it again he'll do it again if you just take a look at where you are now and where you've been when he always come through for you he's the same now as then you may not know how you may not know when but he'll do it again oh you may not know how and you may not know when today to the book of Jude. I want to do the book of Jude today. So we know that perilous times are here. Amen. We're living in perilous times. Amen. In the last days, perilous times will come, but we know that they're already here. Amen. Second Timothy 3 and 1. Now what that means is perilous times the, the Greek definition uh, translates that to, to fierce, fierce times, hard to bear, times that are hard to bear. Anybody feeling that? These are, 
I'm talking about if you, if you are a Christian that's a part of the body of Christ and concerned about spiritual things, about concerned about God's people, love God's people. These are hard, these are hard times to bear. Uh, because it seems like this is, this is an age where, where God has allowed, and I, I wish I had a better way of explaining this, God has allowed things that vex us. Yes, yes he, he's allowed it because God is God. He, he's, he has all power and dominion, and he can stop anything he wants to stop. But as he prophesied, and as the word has foretold, he, as, he is allowing those things that have been foretold to happen in these last days. So there, these are troublesome times, times hard to bear. And, and it, seems like, it seems like the strength of the church is being diminished. The strength of the church is being diminished. Now I can argue, I can argue to you that that the, actual, that the strength of the actual church is not being diminished. Okay, I could make that argument. Uh, but there is a lot of weakness uh, that seems to be in the midst of the body of Christ. Well, in a great house, not just vessels of gold and silver. You see what I'm saying? Uh, and we know that everybody in the church ain't saved. And Jude is going to expound on this somewhat. But I just wanted to point out before we get into the book of Jude, recognize the time that we're living in. Amen. Ephesians 5.15 says that we should redeem the time. Right. It says, see then that you walk circumspectly. Circumspectly. Walking circumspectly means to walk carefully. That's right. Walk carefully, considering the things that are happening around you. Walk carefully, but at the same time, walk accurately. This, this is a day and time that you have to be accurate in your perception and your interpretation and your application of the things of God, of spiritual things. You need to be accurate. Amen. And the reason you need to be accurate is because there's so much inaccuracy Amen. around you. So you have to walk circumspectly, you know, considering the things that are going on around you, uh, redeeming the time. Uh, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Redeeming the time means that you use your time wisely. You invest your time in profitable endeavors. Amen. You know, that's something that every one of us should consider. The time that we have, you know, teach us to number our days that we would apply our hearts unto wisdom. The time that we have, we have to invest that time. Because when your time is up, time shall be no more. And you will have no more time to invest. So while we have the time, we need to invest that time in prayer. Invest that time in the word of God. Like the apostles of old said in the book of Acts. You know, we, we can't afford to stop what we're doing and serve tables. Choose you out some other folk to do that while we give ourselves to the word of God and to prayer. We got to invest our time in the word of God and into prayer. So in the book of Jude, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ, the brother of James. Now, this is the brother of James, who is also James, the Lord's brother. You know, it's interesting in the Bible that Jesus had other brothers and probably sisters, too. Yeah, some of y'all never thought about that. Yeah, he had some brothers and sisters. And, and we would say that they were, we would say they were half brothers. You know, the, um, the whole family, you know, they had a bad name. All right. You know? <laughs> they, they, had, they had a bad name. Come on, first, first Mary have a baby out of wedlock and, and tell my God did it. Yeah, tell, my, tell my God did it. The folk didn't believe that. Nope. They didn't believe that. Jesus, Jesus walked the earth and did miracles, and they still didn't believe it. They still didn't believe he was the son of God. That's why, that's why when he was disputing with the Jews, they say, we, we weren't born of fornication, you was. Right. You see what I'm saying? So they, they had a, that whole family, you know, they were, you know, Jesus had uh, at least four brothers. And the sisters, you know, they didn't name the sisters because back then, you know, it was a man. Well, yeah. 
and the ladies, you know, they didn't, they didn't, count, they didn't count like that, you know. Um, but but that's, that's what was going on. But this, this Jude is one of Jesus' brothers. Uh, according to history, his name was actually Judas. There was a lot of people named Judas back in that day. Uh, but you can understand why he didn't want to carry that name. So he, his, his name was referred to as, as Jude. Okay? And he was actually the Lord's, in what we would consider, the Lord's half-brother. Amen. But here's the important thing. He's going to specify who he's talking to. He, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. He distinguishes. He makes a, a distinguishment. He makes a difference. He discerns. In these last days, we need to understand who we're talking to Amen. and who we're talking about. Because everybody ain't of the Lord. Right. I don't, you know, it seems like we've got this mentality uh, where we group everybody in the same bucket. Everybody ain't in the same bucket. You know, when you, when you criticize the times, when you talk about folks, when you talk about things that's going on, then you've got to be able to differentiate and make a difference. You know, even when you talk about churches, you know, there could be somebody that did something real stupid in a church, but you got to understand, you can't classify everybody in a church the same way. You can't classify everybody that named the name of Christ. You can't put them all in the same category. Because people are on different levels in Christ. People have different levels of dedication to Christ. People treasure Christ differently. Even people that are saved, even people that have been born again, even people that have entered the kingdom of God, they treasure what God has provided in their life, they treasure it differently. To some it's a big deal, to others it's no big deal. Yeah, I'm saved, got the Holy Ghost, but you know, that's like a part-time thing. Something I do on weekends, you know. Ain't got nothing to do with my personal life. You know, ain't got nothing to do with my boyfriend, girlfriend, relationship kind of stuff. Ain't got nothing to do with how I party. And how I have fun. Different. Come on now. Right in the church. You know, that's why, that's why when, you know, you get into the debate uh, about homosexuality and all these kind of things going on. And, you know, Hollywood folk, you know, they switch wives and all that stuff. But, but they still name the name of Christ, too. They still go to church, too. Give more money than you. You know, just saying. Everybody ain't, you can't lump everybody in the same category. And Jude is being specific here. He said, I'm talking about those that are sanctified. And we don't hear that word a whole lot no more. Sanctified, set apart. Everybody ain't set apart. There are a lot of people that name the name of Christ. They've, they've not allowed themselves to be set apart from the world. Places I don't go, things I don't do, things I don't say, people I don't hang with. You know, there's such a thing as come out from among them. Yeah. A long time ago, that used to be a real thing. Yeah. Come out from among them. Amen. And if I come out from among them, then that means I'm not going to come out from among them and still follow their styles. Yeah. And still do like they do, dress like they do, walk, live like they do. What's cool to them is cool to me. No, no, I'm going to be honest with you. You know, if it's cool to you and you don't love Jesus then I'm going to be very, very careful about how I do that kind of thing because if, if it's cool to you, and I know the devil is working in you, so if it's cool to you, then I don't want that to be cool to me. Because me and you, we are different. We're like light and darkness. We... So Jude is very specific. I'm talking about the sanctified folk. Those that have been set apart by God the Father, preserved in Jesus Christ. Those that have been called. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, common salvation. There is still only one plan of salvation. Despite what we're looking at in this day and this time, there's still only one plan of salvation. See, we're living in a time now when people are, are taking the plan of God 
They're taking the plan of God and they're conforming God's plan to their plan. This is what I want to do. So I'm going to, I'm going to formulate a gospel that fits with what I want to do. That's what people are doing. They're not allowing God to separate them and sanctify them. They're taking the gospel and they're twisting it to make it fit the life that they want to live. The life that they're comfortable with. A long time ago, and some of y'all, y'all see, some of y'all are witnesses with me. Because you go back as far as I do. And you might as well support me. You might as well help me out in here. Because you know, back in the day, there was such a thing as repentance. <laughs> I know they still say it today, but back then, repent means to do something altogether different from what it means today. We know about sacrificing. We know about being, allowing ourselves to die, die to ourselves. We know what John the Baptist meant when he said, I must decrease so that he can increase. Some of us still know what that means. So, so, so Jude is telling the saints, the, the saints that have been preserved in Jesus Christ, those that have been sanctified, he's telling them, it's, it's important that I write unto you, it's needful for me to write unto you about salvation and that we should earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. We're living in a time that we've got to fight to maintain we got to fight to sustain. We got to fight to continue that faith that was once delivered to the saints because it's being distorted. Amen. That faith that was delivered to the first church is being distorted. That faith that, that we received 40 some years ago is being distorted. It's a whole different thing now. It's amazing. People nowadays, a lot of them don't even know what salvation is because they've been led astray or they've been misinformed. It's a, it's a shame if you say you're saved and you don't know the date. A lot of this generation that we're confronting now, they don't know when they got saved. They just say they, they're saved. They just say that they've been born again. Being born again is an experience. It's an event. I don't care if you were born in a saved household. That was the first birth. I don't care if your mama and your daddy was apostles. And you were born in their household. You still need to be born again. Let you think on that for a while. Yeah. Are you talking about a born, my daddy was an apostle and I was born in his house and the anointing was there and blah, blah, blah. I got to be born again. Yep, yep. Otherwise, you can't even enter the kingdom of God. Amen. You must be born again. So we've got to contend for the faith. We've got to take a stand. What that means is we've got to be assertive and take a stand for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. We've got to take a stand for the common salvation because there is a warfare going on. There's a war. Some of you probably remember reading in the book of Revelations when the dragon went after the woman. And I'm not going to take time to preach that right now. But when the dragon went after the woman and he could not apprehend her, what he did, he spewed out water from his mouth to drown her. <laughs> the devil can't stop the gospel. He's trying to water it down. Can't stop it. Because he found out even in the first church, the more he persecuted uh, the saints of God, the more the gospel spread. The more he brought persecution in their lives, the more and the harder they preached. And some of us can testify to the same thing. That since we've been Christians, there have been a lot of travail that we've had to go through. There's been a lot of things that we've had to go through, uh, but it did not stop us. It, it, it pushed us. It became a platform. You know, it, it defined our trajectory. In other words, the things that we, we went through defined who we were and how far we would go. Amen. It became a motivator. It pushed us. 
So the enemy knows that he cannot stop us with persecution. It's been proven over and over again. So what his strategy is in this day and time is to water us down. Water us down. That's what he wants to do. Amen. To distort God's plan. Because the only thing going to work is God's plan. So if he can get us on a path that's different from what God intended, uh, then he can do what he wants to do, which is to destroy us and to prevent us from receiving the rewards that God has for those that believe in him. So Jude is telling us to contend, to be assertive. In other words, step up your game, saints. Come on. Those of us that know the truth, those of us that know the way, we've got to step up our game. We can't, we can't let other folk be representative of the body of Christ. We can't let the world criticize the church based on what hypocrites are doing. We cannot let the world criticize Jesus and criticize the church based on what folk that don't know God, they just happen to be church members. They don't know God they just happen to like the church activity. Because, see, we done, we, done, we done put a lot of stuff in the church entertainment that draws people that have no motivation or desire for God, but they like the entertainment. You notice when Jesus walked the earth for 33 and a half years, the only people that hung with him were people that wanted God. You couldn't hang with Jesus if you didn't want God. If you didn't mean right, you couldn't hang with him. Because remember, okay, let me take you back to the fish fry. Amen. The Bible talks about, amen, 5,000, then in one case 7,000. That was just the men. And so there are some people that estimate there was 15,000 people at that fish fry. People love fish. Amen. So, so, so everybody was at the fish fry. Now watch it. Watch it now. Now, so, cause you're thinking you, you're getting the vision. You say, Oh my God, a church with 15,000 members. This is going to be good. You're getting the vision, but watch what, Je watch what Jesus does. Cause see, Jesus wasn't trying to be a mega church pastor. You know, mega church pastors, they send out, uh, forms, surveys. What would you like to see in a church? What kind of entertainment would you like to see in the church? What kind of songs would you like for us to sing? What are the topics that you would like the preacher to preach on? And so they take that survey information and they come back and they design their church service based on what the people out in the world said they wanted. And as soon as they change their design, the people come out of the cracks of the world and the corners of the world and pack their churches out. And like, and like many pastors, you know, there's one, one, one famous pastor that say, well, I don't preach on hell. Okay, boy, that's, that's got to be 10,000 members right there. That's 10,000 extra members right there. I don't, I don't preach on hell. I don't go there. So what about homosexuality? What do you think about homosexuality? Well, I don't think God wants us to condemn people like that. Do you have homosexual friends? Yes, some of my best friends are homosexual. Would you go to a homosexual wedding? Well, I probably wouldn't conduct the wedding, but if, if some of my friends that, who are homosexuals, if they got married and they invited me to the wedding, yes, I'll go. You see, don't, don't want to take a stand. See, the word of God is not going to change. And they want to make it look like church folk hate homosexuals. We don't hate homosexuals. Amen. Churches are full of adulterers. We don't hate them. We, we got a history of having preachers, amen, that commit adultery. We don't hate them. They still preaching. Homosexuality is a sin. Adultery is a sin. Fornication is a sin. We hate the sin like God hates the sin. We don't hate the sinner, but we're not going to change the word of God. We're not going to change the way we preach. We're not going to change our standard because you want a lifestyle that God don't like. We're going to stand with God. Amen. Amen. If God is not happy with you being gay, we're not going to be happy with it. Amen. If God is not happy with you messing with somebody else's wife, we're not going to be happy with it. We're going to stand. Amen. We're going to contend for that faith that was once delivered unto the saints. We're going to hold with that. 
We're going to stay with that. We know it's going to cost us, but we're going to stay with that. We know we'll be persecuted for it, but we're going we're gonna to be hated without a cause. But we're going to stay with the faith that was first delivered unto the saints. And we're going to be assertive about it. And we're going to take our stand. And we're going to step up our game. See, here, here's the problem. Here's the problem. Some of y'all, some of y'all are sports fans, so you can relate to this. You, you know, here's the problem. We're running out of time. We're in the fourth quarter. And you're still playing like you're in the first quarter. You're still playing like the game just started. See, see that you can't, you can't do that. You can't do that. You know, we, you, you can't win no championship if at the fourth quarter and the game is on the line. And there's only a few seconds left in the game and somebody needs to score or we need to stop somebody from scoring. Then you can't be playing with the same energy you played when they first tipped the ball off. No, no, no. You got to be all in now. The game is on the line. You got to be all in. You got to be sold out. You can't be half stepping. You can't be playing games. So we have to be, Judah saying, here's what I need you to do. I need you to contend, to fight for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. Like when you read, when you read in the, in the book of Acts and you see how they, how they took a stand. Because even when they were beaten by the officials and told them don't preach in his name no more. They said we ought to obey God rather than man. And this is the same conviction that we need to have today. With all the things that's facing the church. With all the things that want to come in and be a part of the church. They want, they want to bring the church down to their level. This is, this, see, church used to be a standard. Church, is, is there anybody in here that know what I'm talking about? When I say church used to be a standard that you come up to. When I got saved, I was looking for a higher level in life. I wasn't looking for something to come down to my level. I was trying to get out of the mess that I was in. Don't bring the church and bury the church in the lifestyle that I'm living. I'm trying to get delivered from this lifestyle. I saw the church as a higher standard, a higher place. Amen. I was looking for God to plant my feet on higher ground. I was looking for higher ground. Yeah. Don't bring the church down here. I know, I know what's going on down here. You don't want to bring the church down to this level. But that's what they're doing today. Amen. They got all kinds of, you know, I, I, um, I, 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 I got to stop looking at so much YouTube, but my God, there's so much stuff out there. <laughs> I was looking at this lady in Atlanta. She was called to be a pastor. And there was a dispute in the church because she said God called her to minister to the prostitutes. And she didn't see how she could do that unless she became. I'm just saying, people, this is the kind of world that we... And she not only wanted to minister to the prostitutes, she wanted to hang out there with them, do what they do, make the money that they make so that she could relate to them. So she would be a prostitute on Saturday night and be the pastor on Sunday morning. I'm talking this is real. So that's why we got to fight. Here's, here's what Jude goes on to say. Here's, here's, why, here's why we have to fight. Here's why we have to fight. Because, because certain men have crept in. Now, Jude said men because back then only the men basically were preaching. But now we have to say certain men and women have crept in unaware who were, here, look, look at it, who were before of old ordained. Which, which speaks to us that this was part of the overall plan. False prophets was part of the overall plan. Deceivers was part of the overall plan. People who come to deceive you was part of the overall plan. Wake up, folk, and see what God's plan is, God's plan of salvation. You know, God's plan of salvation is not, uh, is not you can't be a, 
a football team on the field and there's no opposing team. Salvation ain't like that. Salvation ain't where you on the field and your team is the only one on the field. So if you wanted to run to the end zone, nobody will get in your way. That's not the way salvation is. Salvation is like a real football game. There are 11 folks. If you want to get to the end zone, there are 11 folks on the other team that will do everything they possibly can to stop you. So God has allowed uh, that there be hindrances and pitfalls and things in your way. And you have to learn, you have to be spiritually mature enough to learn how to avoid the pitfalls and go through the tribulations and the persecutions and, 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 and overcome all of the deception and still make, make it to your goal. The Apostle Paul said, I press toward the mark. In other words, if there was nothing in front of me, I wouldn't have to press. But there's forces that are trying to stop me. There's stuff that's trying to hinder me. So I press towards the mark of the prize. Men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained ungodly men in the church. In godly men. Jews say they have crept in. That means they're in here with us. They're naming the name of Christ. They're part of the body of Christ. You can't, you just can't take everybody for face value. You just can't take, you know, just, just because they say they are church. You just can't run over there. They invite you, you run right on over there. I just found out that um, there's a church in Greenville. They don't, they don't move to Charlotte now. Um, but the pastor had a first man. They had went to D.C. and got married because they can't get married in North Carolina. But they went to D.C. and got married and came back, and they were married right here in Greenville, North Carolina. And I said to myself, Holy Ghost, please don't let me end up at that church somewhere. You know, because I try to scrutinize. That's why I can't go everywhere when folk call me to preach. I can't go everywhere. When they invite me to a service, I can't go everywhere. When somebody say, I pre I'm preaching, can you come support me? I can't go everywhere. Where you preaching at? I would go online and investigate. That's why I'm so glad for Facebook and all. You can find stuff out by folk. Amen. I ain't going everywhere, Amen. you see. Um, but that's the kind of time uh, that we're living in. These, these ungodly folk, these deceptive folk, these false prophet folk are right in the body of Christ with us. Now, they're not connected to God like we're connected to God. But see, that's the way church is. When the music start playing and the folks start dancing, dancing, the wheat is dancing with the tares. Look at your neighbor and say, you dancing with wolves. That's who you're dancing with. Oh, boy, I'm just telling the truth. You've got to turn on your discernment. You've got to understand the time that we are living in. Amen. You're swarming around with snakes and reptiles and and you've got to know what you're dealing with. They are in among us. Amen. Amen. Somebody used to say the fungus is among us. <laughs> Turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. What's the, what's the theme of this generation? Don't judge me. Ain't that the theme of this generation? Don't judge me. God knows I don't want to judge it. The Bible says, judge not, lest, lest ye be judged. I don't want to judge you. I want to have as much grace and mercy as I possibly can towards you because God said, if you have mercy, I'll be merciful to you. You know, if you, you've got to give grace just like you receive grace. Amen. So I don't want to be judgmental against nobody. Amen. But I am a fruit inspector. I'm, look. I know what an orange is. 
And, and when I look at you, I'm not going to call you an orange if you don't look like an orange, if you don't talk like an orange, if you don't walk like an orange. It's just hard for me to call you an orange. I'm struggling with that. Pray for me. Pray for me. I'm struggling. I'm struggling with that. So this is the kind of time, you know, that we're living in. Lasciviousness is a reckless love of sin without regard to what God thinks of their actions. They are people among us that, has a, that have a reckless love and craving for sin. I mean, they crave it. They wallow in it. It's one thing to fall. Any of us could fall. None of us are perfect. Any of us could fall. It's one thing to fall, but it's altogether different to wallow in it after you fall. You wallowing in that stuff. That's different. Don't be talking to me about no mercy and forgiveness and grace when you wallowing in it. If I take you out of the slop, out of the mud, take you in the house, and, and put you in the shower, wash you up. I mean, get all the mud out from between your toes. And as soon as I let you out the house, you go right back to that mud hole. You're a pig. You're not a sheep. Sheep don't do that. I know sheep. Sheep don't do that. You clean up a sheep, sheep love to be clean. They're going to enjoy that. They're going to preserve that. That's going to mean something to them. But if you get cleaned up and then you go straight, you make a beeline. I'm not talking about you circled the house. I'm not talking about you went round behind the barn. You knew where that slot pile was. You knew where that mud hole was. And you made a beeline right back to that mud hole. You don't need forgiveness. You need to repent and be born again. You need to become a new creature. You don't need forgiveness. You don't need mercy. You don't need grace. You need to repent and get saved. Oh, my God. I'll never fill up the pews like this. Hallelujah. My God, folk don't want to hear this. Amen. Ain't nobody going to shout on this. Ain't nobody going to dance with this. Amen. But we, we, I talk about those of us that go back to the 70s. We have to, we have to be the one to take the stand because we've got to preserve the faith for a next generation. You see? Now, see, I can understand why this generation, I'm going to have to close after this right here because, you know, they, you can't put out too much of this kind of stuff in a short period of time. You got to spread this stuff out. But I can understand why our generation uh, get caught up in the mechanics of trying to create an atmosphere. I mean, that's what they're doing. They're doing it in the mega churches and then they're doing it in the storefronts. <laughs> I mean, it ain't just the big churches. They're doing it in storefronts. They're doing it in mega churches. They're trying to create the atmosphere. They're trying to create the atmosphere. They're trying to make it look like the Shekinah glory is there. They're trying to make it look like the anointing is there. They try to make it look like God is moving. The Holy Ghost took over the service. The reason they do that, I found out why they do that. The reason they do that is because they have never seen the real thing. The reason me and you can't do that is because we know the real thing. We saw it when it was really happening. We don't need no machine to blow smoke because we saw the real smoke. And when you see the real smoke, that, that machine ain't going to do it. You can unplug that bad boy because they ain't going to do it for me. I've experienced the glory of God. I've seen the glory of God. I've been moved by the glory of God. You ain't going to plug something up in the wall, amen, and, and impress me. Because I sing the real deal. Okay, all right. I'm, I keep messing up, but that's, I'm just saying. I'm just saying, you're not going to be able to use 
your charisma to get folk jumping up and down and impress me that God is in the house. Because I was there when God was really in the house. <laughs> Amen. I experienced firsthand God being in the house. And you can't fake it. You can't duplicate it. You can't imitate it. It's just got to be God. But you don't want to pay the price to get the real thing. You don't want to fast and pray and stay in the narrow way and keep your life clean every day. You don't want to pay that price. So you need something you can plug in the wall. You need something electronic. You need to create the atmosphere. Amen. See, we know when God was the atmosphere. We've been in service where God was the atmosphere. We didn't have to create nothing. We didn't have to plug nothing in. A lot of the times we didn't even have, amen, electronic equipment. We had washboards and, and stomping our feet and clapping our hands. Amen. And the Holy Ghost took over the service. Uh, so let me move on. Let me move on real fast. So we're preserving the faith for next. We, we ought to be preserving the faith for a next generation because the hypocrisy and the deceit and the false prophets are coming in with a with a dangerous corruption that's like cancer. And when it first came in, it was a real small thing. Every now and then, uh, it was so small that a lot of times preachers just overlooked it, didn't even pay much attention to it. When all of a sudden everybody started calling themselves prophets, we didn't think that would go so far. To, we didn't think it would go as far as it went. When all of a sudden everybody became apostles, when we went from, we went from, come on, come on y'all, yeah, some of y'all can relate to this. I know your next, gener your next generation folk, you ain't going to understand this, but you old school folk, you're going to know what I'm talking about. We went from women can't preach to now all women are apostles. That's where we are now. If you're a woman and God called you, you are an apostle. Girl, why should you settle for just being a pastor? Why should you settle for just being an evangelist? Be an apostle, girl. Ain't got no church. They following you on Facebook, ain't they? Ain't they following you on Facebook? You're an apostle. Okay. So now, so now quickly, Jude gives some examples of God's judgment uh, through, through the, the rest of the verses, starting with verse 5 all the way down. He began to give examples uh, of God's judgment demonstrating that backsliding is a real thing that's that's something they're trying to do away with they're trying to convince you now that once you get saved you're always saved I, i've been hearing it like never before i'm hearing that like i've never heard it before but jude makes it plain backsliding is a real thing backsliding is so real that the angels who were in heaven already in heaven were cast down for backsliding. And then the people, after God brought them out of the land of Egypt, he destroyed them that believed not. So, so backsliding is a real thing. Amen. And, and that's what we're dealing with now. The scripture said that one of the signs of the last times would be a falling away. It would be a falling away first, and there are a lot of people that are falling away in, this last, in these last days. We're right at the end of the game when really we should be contending and stepping up our game to make sure that when the saints go marching in that we'll be in that number, Amen. and then there are so many of us that are getting slack. Amen. There are so many of us that are backing up. There are so many of us that don't see the value and the treasure of redeeming our time, putting our time in God. <laughs> One of the greatest songs in our generation was all that's left is time to live for Jesus. Found the place.